All right, what's up, man? Good to see you again. It's been a while. Yeah, you too. Uh, yeah, kind of the same old stuff, just uh, winding down the uh, the Constitution crisis, we'll call it. <laughs> it seems to be yeah. taking place all. Yeah, all man, I want to talk with you about that. Is uh, seems Things seem to be opening up in uh, – well, I don't think they ever really closed in Texas. Is that right? No, they did. Um, I'd say probably – you know, not to the same extent that uh, it did in other places, but, uh, you know, they had restaurants, gyms, um, you know, pretty much any non-essential, what they deem non-essential, which even that list is some of it, you're looking at it and you're like, how are you guys deemed essential, you know, versus, <laughs> you know, other places that aren't, but, uh, you know, to me, like between that and, and how they've opened it up and, uh, you know, just the restrictions and regulations that they put on people, um, you know, not, none of it really adds up or makes sense. There's not, not a good rhyme or reason to most of it. Uh, and to me, what's, what's most alarming, uh, you know, is just how, how willingly people are, are okay to just hand over, uh, you know, their, their freedom to, uh, to, you know, elected politicians, which the whole point of it is that they, they work for us, not the other way around. And, you know, for me, it's, it's just real simple is that the government, their job is not to ensure your safety or to look out for your, your well-being. Like they're, they're really, their only job is to ensure your liberty and freedom, you know, and protect your constitutional rights. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's our, it's our job. I mean, no different than, uh, you know, what you sit down and, and shove in your mouth every day, like, you know, to activity or lack thereof, or, you know, how, how carelessly you drive or, you know, do you act like you're filming jackass four on the weekends and do, stupid stunts and dumb shit that, you know, put your life at risk unnecessarily, which to me is every bit as irresponsible as anything. You know, there's, there's so many other things out there that, that are far more lethal or, you know, if, if the government decided that they had uh, it in our best interest collectively as a nation to, to get involved with and regulate and they don't. Uh, but then for, for whatever reason, this hotbed issue has turned into, you know, a political football that I think is, is largely that is that you know I, I think November fifteenth you'll uh, you, you know it'll be largely a blip on on the radar screen if that but uh, so you know for me it's just frustrating uh, you know to see it all transpire um, you know I did an interview fairly early on on uh, value attainment with Patrick Bet David and mm -hmm. we were talking about it uh, right when it kind of first started and I equated it to you know about like the flu and you know took a lot of heat because the the interview aired, you know, about a month afterwards, kind of right at the height of the panic, you know, and everybody's like this dumb fuck, this <laughs> guy has no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I, I've maintained all along, like, I don't think it's that serious, you know, uh, right. are people dying from it? Yeah. People die from a lot of things, you know, uh, people die far more from a lot of other things that you never talk about or, or, you know, the government doesn't get involved in whatsoever. And I don't think they should, you know, it's not an invite for the government to regulate everything else. Right. You know, to me, it, it's simply a statement of saying, hey, be consistent. And that consistency needs to be, you know, protect our, our rights and otherwise let people live live their lives as they see fit. And, and with great freedom comes great responsibility, uh, you know, and it, it should be a big boy rules type of uh, association where, you know, that that's what happens is that you get to pick what what you want to do, but you get to live with the consequences if you make bad yeah. decisions. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Living the way you want to doesn't absolve you of the responsibility. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like you said, if you go out and film jackass for this weekend, yeah, feel free, but you're going to get hurt or killed or you're going to trespass or you're going to do something stupid and somebody's going to shoot you or whatever. But you know that you can do it, but that doesn't mean you get to take yourself out of that responsibility. It's really funny. I, I made a post about, because this $3 trillion stimulus package passed in the House just, what, a couple of days ago, and I had made a post about, look, if, if, if you don't want to pay back your student loans, then don't incur student loans. I mean, that's pretty common sense, right? And I had a bunch yeah. of people, it's crazy, I had a bunch of people push back on that, and, well, you know, they're just kids, I'm like, they're 18 years old, they can make their own choices, oh, but there's predatory lending, cool, still your choice, there's all kinds of bad characters and bad actors, you as an adult... Yeah. We've deemed that 18 is an adult. You as an adult need to make a rational decision. And some guy came back and he says, well, you know, they can't make rational decisions. I said, okay, well, what a, at what age is it rational? Yeah. So really you're just talking about a competency issue. Now, you're not saying that I'm wrong. You're just saying it's a, it's a lack of competency. 
it, it's pretty yeah. pathetic how much that we try to like shelter and bubble wrap and coddle everybody from the consequences of their choices. It's disturbing actually. No, for sure. It is. I mean, to me, you know, my pushback on, on that mentality is real simple is that, you know, take Las Vegas, right. You know, you're, you're welcome to go gamble there at, at that same age, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. how, how, how much of a swindle job is that? It's the same. I mean, it's worse, you know, but right. You know, we're not, we're not putting stimulus packages together to, to bail people that can't keep from fucking gambling together. Right. Yeah. You know, you're, and there's a million other examples of things that, you know, you, you have the opportunity and every day that you get up, you can make a choice to, uh, you know, to be a, a total bonehead, or you can make a choice to, to make a good decision and be responsible. And, you know, you know, as, as well as anybody, you know, that, that daily grind that, that is required to, to, you know, be successful at whatever it is that you want to do. Um, you know, that, that involves a lot of those decisions of behind door a is really sexy, fun and cool and instant gratification and, and requires zero impulse control and would be awesome. Mm -hmm. But behind door B is, is the better answer. That's boring. It's vanilla. It sucks. <laughs> it's not what right. I feel like doing, but that's what, you know, is the, whether it's a micro or macro decision, that's, what's going to get me, uh, you know, closer to where I want to be, you know, and, and the people that have the discipline to do that shouldn't be on the receiving end of punishment for, you know, the droves of people that, uh, you know, have the, Oh, shiny and get distracted and chase it, you know? And, and, uh, you know, I think that's largely what this bill is. It's bailing people out that, uh, you know, that just haven't made good decisions. Of course, not all of them, you know, for anybody listening right. that says, well, there's right. a pick a bill or a, an earmark <laughs> in there that, you know, helps some, excuse me, specific group and, and whatever it, you know, this is a, a generic statement, but that's largely what it is. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of money in that that has nothing to do with what we're talking about that's right. uh, and, and really is, is just bailing people out from making bad decisions or irresponsible decisions, you know, and, and, you know, that excuse that, Oh, they were 18. Well, I, you know, I joined the Navy when I was 17. Exactly. You know, my, <laughs> my parents had had to sign for me. And, and a couple of weeks after I turned 18, the summer after I graduated high school, I was in boot camp. you know, so, if 18 year olds aren't savvy enough, you know, to make decisions based on lending, which, you know, generally their parents are involved in some of that process anyway, uh, you know, then, then we shouldn't allow people to, to join the military till they're fucking 25 either then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or vote for that matter. Like if or you, drive you or vote, all the other things yeah, that these people enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Like why, why can you vote at 18? Then that's a pretty serious responsibility. And these yeah, dipshits man. we're talking about lowering it to 16. Like right. if an 18 year old isn't responsible enough to take out a student loan to go to college, then he's damn sure not responsible enough to, to pick who should be leading our country and making decisions like that. You know, so you, you can't have it both ways. Like it's, it's either you let people live their life and, and you've got to live with the consequences or you micromanage every single aspect of it. Uh, and there's absolutely no uh, leeway in terms of people being able to make big boy decisions. You know, it's, it, you know, you talk about the doors that you can choose. I think sometimes it takes you going through door A and then screwing up and realizing, oh shit, like I don't want to be in that door and then walking backwards and closing the door and going down a different one. But I know for me personally, some of the best lessons were the most painful lessons. The one where I went in that door and I'm like, whoa, I didn't realize this is what was going to happen. Learned the consequence, yep. got my teeth kicked in and then started making different choices from the negative ramifications of the bad choices I was making. No, there, yeah, there's no, no two ways about it. I mean, some of the, the best lessons I've learned have been some of the hardest ones. Uh, and that's something that I, I, you know, just, just before we sat down in here was having a conversation with my oldest child, uh, who's 15 and, uh, you know, and as a girl and is right at that age of, of, uh, you know, knowing everything and, and, uh, you know, just, you know, trying to, to get that point across of, you know, here's, here's what you want to do. Here's what you think is, is important, or here's what you don't care about, you know, and, and it, it's always a balancing act, <clears throat> especially at that age, I think, because they're, they're even younger than, uh, you know, than the 17, 18 year old college loan crowd, uh, you know, so there's still a fair bit of immaturity there, but, you know, I, I try to, to give them the autonomy to make the mistakes while I still have the ability to, to control the consequences and, and right. manage their ability to, to make it or only make it so far, you know, because the last thing that, that I, I want and what I see with a lot of parents out there 
is you know that helicoptering that that micromanaging every single decision that their kid makes or doesn't make um you know, and then ultimately now they, they hit 17, 18, and, and then you run into that, they get swindled with college loans or, you know, life just completely railroads them because they've, they've never had to, to face consequences for their own decisions. And I think, you know, that's one of the biggest problems that we have is, is that, is that, you know, kids, you know, now when they get to, to be out on their own, you know, they've never had somebody say, yeah, you know what, you can do whatever you want but I'm not going to help you out when you fail, you know, or right. you can't pay, pay this, or, you know, you didn't turn an assignment in. You think that's a good idea. Okay. If, if you think failing is all right, I'm going to let you fail. Then you want to sure. repeat the grade. Fine. You, you know, like th- there has to be some of that. And, and obviously that's an oversimplification in terms of, like you can't just let them do whatever they want, but there's got to be some, some leeway there where you allow them to make mistakes and fail and, you know, say, Hey, uh, what would you like to do in, in, you know, situation X? Well, I want to do this. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Yeah, no, I'm good. Okay. You know, even though I know you're going to regret this, I'm going to let you go ahead and do it. You know? Right. Um, and I think that's important, you know, and it's, it's hard. Uh, it's excruciatingly hard <clears throat> as a parent to, to watch your kids make bad decisions and let them do it. Uh, but I think it, it is, is paramount to their ability to be successful, productive adults and not, a dredge on society the way so many of these entitled pricks that seem to be uh, coming of age nowadays are. It, it baffles me that, uh, that it's, it's become so bad, but I think you, uh, I think you hit on the root of the issue, which is it's painful. It's excruciating as a parent. I've got four kids. How many of you kids do you have, Mike? Two. Two. So I got two. They're bo- both girls and teenagers. So yeah. Well, good luck. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not quite at the teenager stage with any of mine. I've got three boys oh, and a awesome. girl, so yeah, I'm sure. But but the point that I think you made yeah. that a lot of people overlook is that as a parent, it's painful to go through that. Like the things that keep me up at night are not like what I'm dealing with my business or I'm going to pay the mortgage. It has nothing to do with me and everything to do with, hey, how are my kids adjusting? Are they making friends? Are they making good choices? Am I teaching them what they need to know? And I think what parent, what a lot of parents do is when they aren't willing to hold their kids' feet to the fire, they're not trying to save their kids. It has nothing to do with that. What they're trying to do is save themselves of the hardship, the pain, the frustration, the headache, the heartache of administering consequences for poor choices. It's very selfish in other words. For sure it is. I mean, to me, it's, it's the lesser of two evils and ultimately the easier path because you know, it's kind of like staying in a relationship that you're not happy with because it's just easier than going through, you know, the breaking up, you know, phase. Right. And, you know, and, and to me, you know, there's, there is that element of like, yeah, it's, it's hard to, to know better and to, you know, have somebody that you love and care about and would do, you know, pretty much anything for to watch them decide to do something really stupid. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but, but you've got to let them do it. And, you know, one of the unique perspectives that, uh, that I feel like I've, I've attained over the years in dog training is, is very similar to that is that, you know, maybe even too much and that because dog training is, is so much more black and white and less gray than, than human relationships are because you don't have the ability to explain anything to them. You know, I can't tell a dog, Hey, you go past this, like you're going to get a correction <laughs> or, Hey, if you do this, you're going to get right. you know, rewarded. They have you to know, learn they, it. They, they have to learn that. Now, granted, you know, where a good trainer comes into play is, is manipulating the environment so that it's really easy for the dog to make the decision you want them to make. And then they get rewarded. And then, you know, mm. that, that becomes a conditioned response. Loop. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, but similarly with, with the uh, corrective measures is that, um, you know, you're not explaining that this is wrong. This is why it's wrong. This is probably why it's not a good idea to go here or whatever, you know, but the, the neat thing about it is that, it, it, it kind of turns into almost like an autopilot response from me is that it, it's really easy to look at the situation and say, you do this, this happens, you don't do this, this happens, and, and just remove my emotional attachment to it as best I can. Now, you know, I'm the first to admit, like, you know, there are times where where they'll get under my skin and, and it's impossible for me to, to not take it personally, you know, especially right. when there's attitude and entitlement involved and things like that. But um, <laughs> But, you know, ultimately I always – circle back and cool off and then think about it. And, and, you know, we come back and sit down and talk about it and say, okay, here's, here's what's going on and here's why. And, and, uh, you know, go, go through it that way. But, uh, but I, I do like the, 
the perspective that dog training brings to to all relationships, whether it's business partners, kids, spouses, you know, you, you name it. But yeah, no, that's true. And, and, uh, I've never really trained a dog prior to our three-year-old German shepherd. And I used your training, which you and I have talked about. Um, and I'm like, man, this is actually like pretty easy when, you know, you use your training and it's significantly easier than if you don't, but then we have a one-year-old, uh, greater Swiss mountain dog. And I'm like, that German shepherd is so, so much easier to deal with, whether it's temperament or breed or whatever, than that Swissy is, oh my goodness. Like I'm realizing how difficult it is. Just like children, they're all different and have their own different personalities. And that dog, you'll tell that dog to come and it'll just stare at you and just like almost look at you like, I know exactly what you want me to do and I'm not going to do it just because you want me to do it. It's so frustrating. So, yeah, so there's two things with that. I mean, number one is that, you know, like you said, all dogs are different, just like with people, you know, cognition, you know, intuition, you know, the ability to read body language, you know, they're all, you know, pretty adapt and gifted to that, uh, but some way, way better than others. Just like, you know, some people, it's way easier to to train them in anything, Mm -hmm. uh, teach them, you know, whatever skill set, you know, some people just pick it up uh, way quicker. So dogs are similar that way, but where where the nice thing about dogs comes in that uh you know it isn't really any different than people but it kind of gives you a almost a guarantee to be able to be successful is just in repetition just Mm -hmm. like with you know i'll use jujitsu since you roll and and i'm sure a lot of your listeners do or at least understand it is that you know there's you know pretty much every technique where you know some you need to drill more for it to become you know muscle memory or condition response you know it taking place without you having to think about it mm-hmm. you know and whether it's body positions or certain you know locks or whatever and so with dogs it's really the same way is that you know some dogs take way more repetition than others but you know at the end of the day ultimately there there is a a finite amount of repetitions that for every dog will get them to that point mm-hmm. you know and so if if you just you know, create a classroom, no different than you do with children is that, you know, you remove the white noise, get rid of all the distractions and have an area that you go to that, that you're using food to shape behavior and condition the dog to, to these responses that you want. You know, th- there is a number of repetitions that, that at, at a certain point that that dog will do it just like that because, you know, you, you've put that amount of time in. It's just where it's tough for people is that if you've got a dog like that, that, you know, is a little bit, we'll call it stubborn, even though I don't like to anthropomorphize quite that much, but Mm -hmm. you know, just maybe it's cognitively not as driven or needs more repetitions to get the point across or whatever is that, you know, there's, there's a, you know, a a kind of risk versus reward or, uh, you know, almost a cost benefit analysis type of approach to it where, you know, you you have to ask yourself like, Jesus Christ, is this worth it? You know, and and that's, you know, what it is with a lot of rescue dogs. I get asked all the time, you know, are, can all dogs be saved? You know, I would say largely, yes. I mean, there, there are a very, very small, I mean, a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of dogs that are just hardwired and they're fucking crazy, just like with people, right? That, you know, whether, (laughs) whether it's, you know, a combination of of genetics and, and, you know, it's nature and nurture, it's, you know, maybe they, they weren't fed properly and their brains didn't develop, they you know, we're, we're castrated or spayed too early and they have a hormonal imbalance and that, you know, there's some sort of chemical thing going on or they're just plain, you know, their, their wiring is crossed and, and they're nuts just like with some people, but it's, it's very few. What happens most of the time is that people get frustrated. They inadvertently create all of these undesirable behaviors and then ultimately end up getting rid of the dog for shit that they created. Right. Uh, that if they, if they would have just been consistent, the same way you are with trying to get in shape, become a black belt in jujitsu, be a, a great chef, uh, you know, be a, a world class Olympic lifter, you name it, is that any of those skill sets can be obtained if if you put the time in or consistent and have a, a, a blueprint print or a roadmap to get from A to B, just like with anything else, you know, building a business, you name it. So uh he, he's he's trainable. It's just you run into that point and, and back to my point of are all dogs savable is that Yes, uh, I, I think almost all of them are. It's just with with some of them, it's is it is it worth taking you know one person or several people's time where where that's basically a full time job for two years to rehabilitate this dog to get him to work and just live a normal life? Like to me, no, probably not. Hmm. You know, it's it's not not worth you know one or or several human beings' entire existence to to get this animal to a point where he's not trying to kill little kids or 
uh, you know, bite its owner or is so scared of every stimulus out there that it blows its anal glands when a, a car drives by or, you know, right. when you have, you know, levels of severity to that degree with dogs, in my opinion, that that's when you kind of run into the, you know, could you, could you do it? Yeah, but it's really not worth, uh, you know, what it's going to take, or it's just not, re- it's not that it's not worth, it's just not realistic, you know? And so that's, that's kind of what you're faced with in, in those circumstances. Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting coming from your perspective, you know, where you trained us, like some of them, it, it's, it's not worth it. I, I actually, with my Swissy, I actually enjoy it because yeah. for lack of better term, stubborn, I get what you're saying there. Because you, if the, if I'm understanding you correctly, the reason you don't use that word is because it's not like human stubbornness, right? Like willpower, right? You sure. don't want to liken it to that. Is that what you're saying? A hundred percent. Because what, and half of why people struggle so much with training their dogs is because they look at it from the human perspective, right? And so if you think about one real key concept with dogs, which is they don't think in a language right mm-hmm. so you know you and i you know we talk in a language you dream in a language you think you reason your way problem solve through you know through an internal monologue that you sure. have and that's how you think right and so now um, imagine going through your day where everything is like it's a plus b equals c you're making a simple association with everything so even thinking that your dogs think the way you do sets people up for failure thinking that they have as complex set of emotions as we do sets you up for failure. You know, you, you really have to do your best to remove all of your emotional attachment from it uh, and, and really get, get that consistency in just like with anything else. And, you know, with my online training, I, I'm, I'm always, you know, impressed and, and continue to be amazed at, at how many people, you know, have tried a lot of different things. And once they just do it themselves and and put the time in and be consistent, you know, they have overwhelming success, you know, and and that no doubt hinges on your ability to remove all of the distractions. And that's where, uh, you know, that, that coupled with, you know, not thinking of it from the dog's perspective, which is part of removing the distractions is, is where people fail. Because if you, if you think of, you know, the 24 hour day broken down into one hour blocks, Right. You've got, let's just say liberally, you're, you're spending three or four hours a day training your dog, which nobody does. No, right? of course. Even then you've got, you know, three or four hours a day that you're training. Well, you've got, you know, 20 to 21 other hours that now what is taking place in those hours, right? Well, if it's free time where the dog can self, self-discover all over your house, self-reward, uh, you know, can, can get into things and, and interact with other animals, you know, be pet and have affection from, from other family members, you know, take long hikes and walks and, and be completely independent of you and have no association with you during all of that time. Now you're creating an, an overwhelmingly lopsided scenario where most of the dog's day has nothing to do with you that's fun. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and all of the things that they're learning and, and figuring out in that A plus B equals C sequence have zero to do with you. And so now, even if you're spending four hours a day, if, if those other 20 hours are spent doing a ton of cool shit with, with no association to you, you're never going to win that battle. And so, you know, you've got to do almost a, a boot camp type scenario early on, not for the life of the dog. The dog doesn't need to be created his whole life. And then quite the contrary is that if you put that time in the same way you do with working out and eating right, or, you know, training and and doing jujitsu and studying and and recovering properly and, and thinking about, you know, your next workout and and how you're going to do things and, 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 you know, visualizing all that stuff is that that's what sets you up for success. And so if you remove all of that ability to do that by keeping the dog crated, when you get them out, you're feeding them through training, you're not feeding them any less, you know, you, you put the, the amount of food that he's going to eat for that day anyway on top of his crate. He goes in the crate. Uh, before you get him out, you put some of the food in a pouch. You've got a clicker, hook a leash to him, go out. And now you're just reinforcing. You're shaping and reinforcing him Look, looking at you, making eye contact, sitting, recalling, downing, you know, all, all the things that you want him to do. I typically will just walk around my backyard, and, and every time the dog comes over to me, I mark it, give him food, and I walk away from him. You know, and, and three days later, the dog won't leave you alone. Like he's glued to you like Velcro. Right. And then from there, now you can shape, you know, all of the behaviors that you want, all of the more, you know, complex uh, behaviors. But it starts with that is that it's, it's making that association that every calorie that that dog gets comes from you. And over, you know, a few weeks to a few month period, depending on, again, the cognition of the dog, how old he is, what other baggage he might have, what his genetics are. 
uh, all of those things are going to contribute to how long you need to, to do that. But with, you know, 99% of the dogs out there, it's, it's a couple of months at the most, just like boot camp or a police academy or whatever, uh, is that, you know, you're, you're a total immersion type of approach. Similarly to, you know, you learn a language far faster moving to Spain than you do taking Spanish two hours a week in high school. Sure. Uh, and, and so that's essentially what it's doing. It's just hyper focusing and, and super concentrated so that the dog is, is drinking from a higher hose, but is picking up all of that so that now a couple months down the road, you've got a dog that does everything you want him to do, stays out of the things that you don't want him into, uh, you know, will recall, you know, even if there's traffic or a squirrel running by or whatever, because you've, you've built that into him and, and conditioned it properly. But just like with all of the other things that are cool to, to obtain, being in great shape, you know, earning a new belt in jujitsu, you know, learning how to, how to make something from scratch. You've got to put the time in and, and be dedicated and disciplined enough, you know, to, to do that and, and make it happen. Uh, and then, and then it will be there. And once it's there, it's way easier to maintain that than, you know, living for 10 years with the dog where he's constantly nagging and, and it's just a, a, a constant right. problem. Well, I mean, not only that, it's just, it's so much more rewarding because I've had dogs in the past and I've been so frustrated and it has less to do with the dog and more to do with me because I take it personally, right? Like a human would yeah. as opposed to objectively. But I've noticed with, with my dogs and going through, through your training is like, it's just being a dog owner is so much better because I've yeah. built those foundational principles. Like I've heard them referred to as first principles, right? These are the things that once they learn and establish and adopt, then you can start introducing more complex situations and circumstances and tricks and whatever else. But it's funny because at this point with my German shepherd, my son's actually German shepherd, uh, he'll actually look to me almost for like approval in a way. And there isn't a whole lot of communication that needs to happen or at least that I can acknowledge, but there's probably some sort of body language, nonverbal communication that's happening that he is now recognizing and acts mm -hmm. by the way that I think, you know, it's, so it's kind of an, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon to see him work through that in circumstances that he's never been exposed to before. Now you're talking, your son has this with you or the dog is looking at you the, that way? The, I wish my son would look at me like that. He's yeah. got a little bit more of independence <laughs> than the dog does, but yeah. I'm talking about the dog specifically. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a great point and, and it, it really highlights again, the, the difference between people and, and dogs. If you think about, uh, you know, if you've been in a Walmart parking lot, right. And you see somebody from 300 yards away that, you know, you've never met this is the first time you've ever, ever come in contact with them. And you can tell that they're having the worst day of their life. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, on the contrary, they're maybe they're having, you know, the best day of their life or whatever. Uh, but if you think about how overwhelmingly verbal we are, like, yes, we use body language, we use our hands, you know, we use social cues when we talk and, and that conveys certain points or emotions, feelings, et cetera. But, but we're, we're overwhelmingly verbal in, in how we communicate, whether it's through text or email, phone calls, you know, even zoom calls, whatever is that most sure. of, of our, our communication is, is, uh, is done through, through language. Right. So now, if you think about how easy it is for us as human beings to now identify other human beings and, and whether they're angry, whether they're sad, whether they're happy, whether, you know, you name it, is that you get a pretty good idea of, of what somebody's intent is or their emotions just by looking at them. Now imagine a dog who that's their entire world, mm -hmm. right? Is that they, they don't, they don't use language at, really at all. Um, you know, they use some verbal uh, cues here and there and, and barking and whining and things of that nature, but it's very limited by comparison. 98% of the way that they communicate is all non-verbally, all body language, right? So it, what it forces you to do is, again, is think of it from the dog's perspective, but also be hyper aware of, of what you are doing or not doing, right? Is, is that, you know, you see it a lot in detection dog training where the handler is cueing the dog as to, you know, if, if he's, you know, it's almost like playing Marco Polo, mm -hmm. you know, where, where the handler, and this is why when you do in training, you, you generally don't want the handler to know where the odors are is because they usually will cue the dog that, that they're there and, and they don't even realize they're doing it. The dog's constantly looking for feedback, you know, but they're, they're constantly yeah. doing that all the time, right? Is that, you know, whether you're sad, whether you're, you know, whatever is it, you know, you've probably been in a scenario where you've lost your temper or gotten angry and your dog was, was in the vicinity, but it had nothing to do with the dog and your dog recognized that and was like, fuck you, I'm out of here. Right. right. Oh, for and, sure. And so, yeah. 
right? And, and so that that tells you a lot about their ability to recognize your emotion, right? And it's not that they can smell anger or fear or any of those other things. Yes, there there is a hormonal component that, uh, you know, that, that there's, you know, you could argue that there's a, a scent picture there. But most of what it is, is that, you know, when people are angry, they, they act a certain way. When people are happy, they act a certain way. When they're scared, they act a certain way. And, and you know, one of the uh, adages we use in, in dog training is, you know, your emotion travels down the leash and, and it absolutely does, you know, so you've mm. got to be very cognizant of what your emotions are, A, and B, just generally speaking, what your body language is, you know, they, they watch your eyes, they watch your hands, you may just, you know, do, do this or, you know, it's almost like, like a third base coach in baseball, you know, a couple little things that, that you don't realize you do every time you tell them to sit or when you, you know, see them about to do something you don't want them to do. And, and, you know, it's almost like a tell in, uh, in card playing is that, you know, we sure. have all of these little nuances and, and micro uh, movements that, that, uh, that we have that we largely are unaware of because we're not paying attention that cue the dog to certain things. So, um, you know, when, on those early parts of training, it's imperative that you are really aware of, of removing all of your body language to the best of your ability and, and really focus on, on not moving, not using your eyes, not cueing the dog, not, you know, fidgeting or, or anything like that so that you're really using and communicating slash teaching the dog that it's the dog's actions that determine the consequences. Again, just like with kids is that, you know, if I put them in my classroom and I, you know, I'll, I'll we get to a certain point, I'll, I'll specifically or purposely put distractions in there and, and I'll let him go mess with him. And the second he stops messing with him and turns his focus back on me, I mark and reward that mm. so that I teach him, you know, the, the world isn't going to be absent of distractions, but, but what you need to understand is that no matter what's going on, when I tell you to, to come here or to look at me or to heal or, or whatever is that you do it. Uh, and that's where the muscle memory and, and repetition comes in. You slowly build in those distractions so that, you know, cause if you tried to go like, you know, Hey, my dog is leash reactive and you say, okay, well, let's take him out on a leash and, and put him five feet away from a dog that wants to rip his head off. And mm -hmm. now we'll try to work through that. Like you're 12 steps ahead of where you should be. The car is way before the horse. You know, if you can't get his attention when nothing is going on and there's n there's no competition stimulus wise, then you're damn sure not going to have it way out in town. You're, you're going from K to, to master's level, right? So, uh, so it's about building the repetition in where where there's not a lot of things going on, and then you interject a little bit of distraction. And once they they understand that, and, and now they understand, hey, this is cool, but I only get what I want when I look at at him. You know, then you just build on that and then you take them, you know, into your house and then in the front yard and then right down the street. And then you just slowly get more and more distracting, uh, you know, the same way you kind of graduate through um, elementary, junior high, high school and the college, et cetera. And then you just slowly build that in with repetition. And now you've got a dog that, you know, it, can walk by other dogs that are trying to kill him and squirrels are running by and bouncing off his back and you're throwing a basketball in front of him or, you know, and, he, and he's just sitting there looking at you, you know, he, he healing through the gauntlet because you you've taught him that that's the only way that, uh, that the life works. <clears throat> yeah. It sounds like this is an interesting perspective because it's helped me shift my mind a little bit. You're not trying to like control necessarily the dog as much as you help me if I'm wrong on this, but almost give it autonomy like allow it to choose well, yeah, based I mean, on the response. I, sure. I, you know, I, I'm not a, a religious guy, but a good analogy is, is Christianity and free will, right? Is that, you know, you're saying, Hey, or with kids, like you want to go check out that, that hot wire fence, knock yourself out. Like <laughs> right, maybe right. even literally, uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, but I'm going to sit here and I, like, I'm not even, I'm not going to look at them. I'm not going to say their name. I'm not going to stay, you know, and, and I'm not going to do any of that. Right, because what that does is it lures or accuses the dog. What I want him to understand is that, hey, no matter what is going on out there, is that the only time that, that you're making that A plus B equals C reference is that when you turn and look at me or come over to me, that's when it, when it gets marked and rewarded, hmm. right? <clears throat> and so now when I build in all of these other distractions, it can be active, it can be passive, it can be uh, auditory, it can be olfactory. I mean, you know, things that smell you know, attractive things that, that, you know, incite their prey drive, you know, auditory ones that get their attention. They're like, what the hell is that? You know, all of these different stimuli that dogs are inherently going to check out and show interest in. 
is that I stand there like a telephone pole and the dog is hungry because the only time he gets fed is when he looks at me and they learn that really fast. Oh, I bet. You know, yeah, I bet. you know, really fast when, and, and the key is, is exactly that is that, you know, put the food in the pouch and they, and it gets marked and rewarded when they do what you want. Now, if you're feeding the dog and then trying to go train, giving them three meals and bully sticks and <clears throat> cow knuckles and, and, you know, all these different, you know, scraps and things like that. And, and, and that, reward value is pretty low for food that's you know akin to saying hey we just had a steak dinner and now sweetheart if you go clean your room and do a real bang up job you'll get a free bowl of brussels sprouts they're going to be like who gives a <laughs> so fuck why about would I want sprouts? that <laughs> right so it's, it's the same thing with them is that you know and again you're not starving the dog you're just you're feeding him in a different way like he's still getting the same amount of food but he's getting it a handful at a time for doing what i want him to do without telling him to do it because mm. the other big problem people have is what, you know, they'll, they'll bring a dog in and they'll say, sit, you know, well, the dog's not sitting. Well, he has no fucking idea what sit means, you know, or, right. you know, watch like the dog doesn't know what watch means. He doesn't know what anything <laughs> means, you know? And, yeah. and again, you know, one, one of the things that where people screw up to, to use another detection work analogy is that if they're looking for marijuana, they're, they're not looking for marijuana. They're looking for whatever you've rewarded them for finding. So if you've got right. you know, your, your body odor on it or you just had a bacon cheeseburger and that grease is on it or whatever containers you're keeping it in or you know the certain type of gloves that you use, you've got to proof the dog off of that stuff. And so it's, it's no different here in that you know, they're, they're not going to understand anything other than what they've been rewarded for finding. And, and where people make a lot of mistakes, again, is they, they let the dog self-reward. Hey, there's a squirrel over there. Let me go chase it. When he decides to come back, you ignored him. Well, what did you just teach him? He gets nothing from you and everything right. from chasing a squirrel, right? Exactly. Whereas you flip that, you flip that script and say, "I know you're hungry. I have, I have what I have. There's a squirrel there. Yeah, go chase it. You get nothing until you come back to me. You know, and then you mm. come back to me. Bam, you get fed with a primary reinforcer that you have to have to sustain your life." And over a couple week period, you know, you can take dogs that didn't have high food drive, that didn't really want to work, don't care about a tennis ball, can give a shit about attention. And now that they work like a, a high drive Malinois and, and are flashy and, and swinging their ass into your knee and, and you know, high stepping and, and, you know, focused attention healing through, you know, a crowded area of, of kids and, and, you know, ice cream cones and hot dogs falling and, you know, you name it is, is that. <laughs> it's it's truly remarkable you know how well you can condition a dog that's mind is already set up to to work that way to do really whatever you want uh, mm. and and they're all capable of it again it's just you know how many repetitions is going to vary dog to dog but uh you know i've done it with I me mean, i've got tens of thousands of of clients on uh, on the online training and and uh you know it, it's it's so, it's really cool to see you know people that have struggled for years or you know, tried having other people train their dogs and whatever. And then the reality is just like with kids or with a spouse or, you know, an employee with, uh, or an employer or a boss with employees, whatever is that you've got to put that time in, you know, yes, you can have help, uh, you know, and you can have, help, you know, people, you know, watch you train and, and tweak and do weekly lessons or even do board and trains and then one-on-one <clears throat> uh, -on -one sessions with them afterwards to keep it up. Uh, but the, the most effective way is, is really to do it yourself and it's not complicated. You know, right. it's far more rewarding to do it yourself also. But. <clears throat> well, I think people just want to, I, I agree with the rewarding side of it, but I think people just want to outsource it because it's easier, right? It's easier just to pay somebody yeah. to train and it's easier to just like not have to worry about it and then have it come back and it be, yeah. be this well-behaved dog. Um, well, even, even me, that like, has a shelf life though. Of is, course, you know, right. if, if you're having a hard time with your kids and you send them to boarding school and they're there for nine months, a year, whatever, and they come back and they are, you know, drum tight, military right. bear, bearing laden little pricks that, you know, now <laughs> are, are towing the company line. When they come back, if you give no feedback in terms yeah, of reinforcing them. the good behavior and, and, you know, continuing to correct or, or extinguish the bad behavior, they're going to go right back to what they were doing. And, and dogs do that all the time, you know, so Board and trains work great if whoever does that, you know, works with you afterwards and teaches you and educates the owner how to maintain it, then it works great, you know, because I'm not naive to the fact that, you know, some people are like, look, dude, I don't have two months, you know, to, to do that with my dog. Hey, I get it, you know, and in that case, do a board and train, but understand how to maintain it. You know, it can't just mm -hmm. be a, a handoff of the torch and, and, and uh, you know, you expect it to go well because it's just not going to. I mean, no different than if you work your ass off for 90 days and get in great shape and then 
stop working out, guess right. what's going to happen? Goes away. You know, of course. Same, same thing. You know. So, <clears throat> do dogs? Uh, you're talking about them not being obviously language driven, ninety eight percent or whatever you said. But do they start to understand tone? Is that is that what they're looking for? Is they're looking for tone? Like I see these guys giving dogs commands. I'm like, obviously they know what that command means. Or maybe it's just some sort of physical cue that they're picking up on that we don't acknowledge we're doing, or it's both. It's both. Um, you know, where where the command is going to determine whether or not the dog understands it is the context. You know, one of the things I do with people are like, yeah, my dog knows sit. I'll bet he doesn't, you know. And, and so the dog, you know, you'll have a ball, a treat, whatever, and you, you call the dog over to you and it comes and you say sausage or broccoli. And then the mm -hmm. dog will sit is that the, the <laughs> dog knows contextually when he comes over to you and you have something he wants, when he sits, he gets something, he gets it from you right. for sitting. So the he doesn't, dog doesn't know that under word. He understands the behavior. He doesn't understand the command. Exactly. Right. And so when, when a dog truly knows that, and, and what I recommend in my training and show it is, uh, you know, it's basically, you know, not saying the command until the dog does it predictably without saying anything, without cueing him, you know, body language wise, whatever the dog just sit, Mark reward it, sit, Mark reward it. He just, right. he knows every time he gets the reward, bam, he sits, bam, he's, you know, at that point and, and you know, with 98% predictability and success, now I'm going to couple it with the command and drill it until the dog knows it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If you really want to see if a dog understands the command, have him go from downing up to sitting you know, and can do it from anywhere, you know? So if you're standing behind, you know, the kitchen counter and the dog is walking and you say down and the dog downs, sit, and the dog comes up into a sit, then for sure they understand what the command means. Uh, now, you know, for a lot of people, may maybe they don't need to understand the command and they just need to understand the behavior through a contextual thing. I would disagree with that, but uh, you know, from a safety standpoint, I, I want the dogs to at a minimum recall and heal no matter what's going on. What do you mean you know, by a safety, safety perspective? So, you know, a, a car's going by and the dog's chasing a squirrel. Ah, uh, okay. You know, yeah. I, I want to be able to say, you know, Duke here, no matter what is going on, and that dog spins the fuck around and comes back, you know, and right. so th those sure, two okay. commands and healing the same way is if you're out in town with a dog and, uh, you know, who knows what's going on, maybe, you know, other dogs are trying to, to get at it or, or kids or, you know, who, mm -hmm. there's a million scenarios that you can come up with where, the dog not healing away from wherever you're at uh, is a bad deal. And, and so, you know, no matter what's going on, I want to be able to say, you come here and you walk with me, no matter what's going on to wherever we need to get to go. Like to me, at a minimum, everybody's dog should at least be able to do that. I mean, to me, the basic five obedience behaviors is something that dogs should also be able to, to do no matter what's going on. But, um, but at a minimum, I think just, you know, if you're going to own a dog, like at least be able to do that. And, and again, that just comes back to conditioning. But. What's your, uh, what's your take on socializing your dogs with other, with other people? Same thing. Um, you know, I, I would say it's kind of akin to saying, well, you know, do you want to socialize your wife with other guys? No. <laughs> I mean, right. Sure. You know, ask yourself, you know, ask yourself, you know, and, and here's a, a huge misconception. I think that, that we have more as a Western society, there's other parts of the world that seem to get this a little better than we do but it's it's the play date mentality it's the go say hi oh he's okay go you know go be pet by so and so mm -hmm. you know the big the big question you need to ask yourself is why do you want your dog to interact with other dogs with kids with other other people that that aren't in you know immediate family members mm -hmm. if it's an immediate family member yes absolutely if of it's course, everybody they're else be around more often sure Right. If it's anybody else, no, I don't want you petting my dog. I don't want your dog interacting with my dog. I don't want you touching him, looking at him, you know, feeding him, any of those things, because there's no reason for it. Uh, dogs, you know, and again, I'm not of the mindset or mentality that uh, that dogs are, are wolves at their core and, and everything is, is a, a complete parallel. But there are a lot of, um, you know, traits that are passed down through uh, you know, through that species that, that exists. And if you think about any predatorial animal is that, you know, they don't go and, and just intermingle and, and mix it up with other animals, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, right. you know, they're, they're with their group yeah, and pack. that's it. They don't, yeah, they, they don't need, you know, to, to be socialized with all these other things. And so, you know, one, one of the, I've got a YouTube video that, um, where I talk about that is that, you know, here's, here's why you shouldn't socialize your dog is mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and I think it's, it's a little bit of semantics or it's a terminology issue where, 
uh, you know, a lot of times people assume that, that socializing, you know, every dog should be social. What does that mean? Well, to me, that means that the dog needs to be tolerant of everything, right? Is that I need to be, I need to be able to, and should be able to take my dog anywhere and have him not react to me. That mm-hmm. is a socialized dog. I don't want a dog that has to play with other dogs and get along with them. Fuck. I don't get along with most people. I don't <laughs> expect my dog to. Right. Uh, and I think it's foolish from, you know, cause what I can guarantee is if your dog never interacts with other dogs, guess what's never going to happen. The dog's never going to get in an accidental fight. He's never going to catch some weird fucking disease that some other dog has. Uh, he's never going to bite a child for pushing the line or, or, you know, doing something stupid or or being reactive. He's never going to knock somebody's old grandmother over because she couldn't handle him bumping into her or whatever. Is that you're never going to have those problems if your dog, no matter what's going on, is looking at you for direction. Right. right? Is that that, again, that, that should be the goal is that I don't take my dogs to dog parks. I take my dogs all over the place with me. But when we go there, they're focused on me. You. And, and, and that's on purpose is that I don't want them self rewarding with other people. And, and now, desiring affection from complete strangers, you know, for a number of reasons, you know, all, all the ones we already talked about, but, uh, and, and I, again, I feel that way with other dogs, with, with other people's children, with, with, you know, strangers, you name it, is that it all fits into the same category as, is there's no reason for it, you know, and on the contrary, there's a bunch of reasons why you, you wouldn't want them to interact with all of those people, you know, again, for all the, the things we've mentioned. So, um, you know, to me, it's, it's a terminology issue where, I think most people have uh, have the wrong idea of what a socialized dog means. You know, again, not to beat a dead horse, but to me, you know, having a dog that's that socialized means that you can take them into any environment and they mm-hmm. won't react to it. Uh, you know, to me, that that is what socialization means. Yeah, I, I guess by that definition, most people would assume that socialized, if we're using that that way of describing it, equals well behaved. Right, that they think, oh, this dog is well behaved because it can get along in all these environments, and you're saying, no, yeah. it's not. That doesn't well, necessarily mean yeah. that dog's well behaved. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's one of those. I think it's just misguided, and that I think what what most people assume is that if I let my dog interact with all these other dogs, he's going to be social to them and not fight with them. Mm. Right? Is that if you if you don't let your dog interact with all these other dogs, then he's going to want to fight everything. And again, you know, to me. No, is that, you know, the, the other half of the equation that you have no control over is that other dog, right? Is that, you know, dogs are animals the same way we are. I mean, when you go up and meet somebody, you know, th- there's a limit as to how much grab assery and, and eye fucking and, and social challenging and dominance that you're going to take from another man, right? And so dogs are largely that way also is that, yeah, they may, they may be cool at first, you know, but then the other dog comes here. And so now your dog goes here and then he comes mm-hmm. here and it's like the, the baseball bat thing. And now they're in a fight, you know, for, for nothing, right. Is that if you want to keep your dog from, from, you know, being a pain in the ass with other dogs, again, I can't stress enough. Don't let them interact with other dogs because now you're doing two things is one is that you're, you're allowing him to do it. So he thinks it's okay. Mm-hmm. And then two is that you're, you're presenting an opportunity for things to go wrong over and over and over. You know, um, so again, the, the easy way around that is to become the dog's universe by doing all the things that we talked about and then, you know, building that conditioning in. And then now, yeah, I'm going to take him to Home Depot. I'm going to take him past the dog park. I'm not going to go into it, um, but I'm, I'm going to have him around all of these different things and he needs to be able to deal with it, but he needs to just pay attention to what I'm doing and that's what he's going to be rewarded for. So he can tolerate all of those other things. Even to a point where another dog comes up to him and, and he's still ignoring the dog and looking at me. It's one of the things I do with my personal protection dogs is that, you know, I'll use other dogs to come running up and bump into them and, you know, have a ball in their mouth and, and right. go under them, you know, and that dog is still just looking at me, even when another dog is messing with them behind the fence, barking, trying to, trying to attack them. I want that dog, no matter what's going on, is he's paying attention to me because that is your your most effective seat belt and insurance policy to 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 increase your chances your percentage uh, chance at at no no problems happening with your dog uh, again in any environment <clears throat> did you learn all this stuff on on your own did you did you work with somebody is this like trial and error and you figured all this stuff out like how did you get to the point where you are so it's a combination of a lot of things uh, I, I've been very fortunate 
uh, and being able to train with and, and learn under, you know, some amazing dog men over the, over the last 20 years in a host mm-hmm. of different capacities, you know, not just in police dogs, but in, in hunting aspects and, and others. Um, you know, so for sure, I, I, I owe, you know, too many people to even name, frankly, but, right. uh, but yeah, I, I've learned a lot. I mean, to me, again, it's a lot like jujitsu where, you know, you're under the tutelage of a lot of people, you know, some of them are, are at your level. Many of them are much higher. Some of them are, are worse, uh, you know, and it's a collective, you know, absorbing of, of all of that in conjunction with thinking about it yourself and learning yourself and trying different things and having success. And then, you know, some of the things that work for me maybe don't work as well for other people, similarly to jujitsu. With dog training, it is, and I guess similar to jujitsu, there, there's some basic principles that just exist mm-hmm. irrespective of body type and age and sex right. and, you know, things like that. But within the spectrum of those principles, there, there are nuances that exist that, that, you know, maybe you focus a little more on certain things or whatever. Where I've learned a lot on my own is through the Warrior Dog Foundation dogs. You know, we've taken in, it's, it's been in existence for 10 years. Um, it'll be 10 years this August. We've taken in almost 200 dogs and, and of all of these dogs right now, we've got 25 of them, you know, and, and every single one of these dogs are dogs that come to us because they were with a, a unit and they got to the point where they were going to be euthanized because they had become such a pain in that unit's ass. Even mm-hmm. if it's because they're, they're old age and they're being retired or some of them are, you know, a year and a half or two. And they're just such, such a pain in the ass to deal with that we get them is that, uh, you know, every one of them was to the point where if you guys don't take this dog, we're going to put them, put them to sleep, you okay, know? And yeah. so for them to even come to us, you know, they've already checked a lot of boxes and then have 12 strikes, uh, you know, against them to the point where they were going to be euthanized. And these are dogs that, you know, have tens of thousands of dollars, you know, right. put into There's them big investments what, into these animals. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, no department is, is going to, you know, decide this easily. Like they, they've given the dog a number of chances. They've given the handler a number of chances, trainers, other handlers, et cetera. Uh, and so for the dog to, to get to us, it's, it's a pretty severe case. And so, you know, these are all dogs that you're not going to, you know, slap your dick on the counter and show this dog who's boss, you know, a bunch mm-hmm. of other people have tried that and have wound up in the hospital Doesn't for work. doing it. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you have to think smarter. And so that a lot, a lot of these lessons that I've talked about, you know, yes, are, are for sure, you know, there aren't things that I thought of. They're, you know, concepts that have been around for a while and that other people uh, far smarter than me have, have uh, you know, gotten me to where I am. But but in that hands-on experience of having, you know, dozens and dozens of dogs over the years that are all different but the same in certain ways um, and having to figure out, you know, we've got to be able to, to work with this dog. We've got to be able to, you know, clean his kennel out. We've got to be able to feed him. We've got to be able to play ball with him. We've got to be able to put him in a crate. We've got to be able to take him to a, a vet without, you know, us getting bit or the vet getting bit. You know, just basic day-to-day stuff. We're not operating at a high level with these dogs, mm-hmm. but, you know, the normal day-to-day care, we've got to be able to, to accomplish with these dogs. And so kind of by default, you're forced with a, you have to figure out how to be able to get these dogs to do it. And, and that's, overwhelmingly how it is done is, is using food and, and positive reinforcement to just condition the dogs to do what we want. You know, something as simple as, as muzzles, right? A lot of dogs when they're, they're driven and they're, they're predatory and they're dominant and they're, you know, type A personality or double A, they don't want a fucking muzzle put on them. You know, they don't like it. They, They associate it with fighting because, you know, a lot of units do a lot of muzzle work where they're putting the muzzle on and then sending the dog in to, to attack them. And so, they have that association of muzzle equals be a motherfucker. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, something as simple as just, you know, smearing peanut butter or uh, pill pockets because they're pretty malleable and, and mashing four or five of them in the end of it and just sitting there casually and the dog comes over. And, and again, I'm not calling him over. I'm not putting it on him. I'll sit there and just hold it right here. And when the dog comes in he, and he just puts his, his face in the muzzle to smell it, I'm going to mark it and let him, let him eat some of it. And then I'm going to pull it back and let him go do his thing. You know, just something right. as simple as that. Like instead of making him wear the muzzle and fighting him on it, you know, I've got the straps pulled all the way back and I'm just holding it here, you know? And so it may take a dozen of those sessions before right. I even Lots try to put the, put the strap around it, you know? Uh, and you know, over a few weeks time, you get to where now you can put it on him. And, and now once it's on him, now he's a pain in the ass. Well, now something as simple as taking a soccer ball and kicking it and letting him play with it, with the muzzle on, instead of fighting me and, and having that, you know, conflict, I'm going to, I'm going to kick a soccer ball around and now he gets to play ball and, and punch muzzle, punch the soccer ball. And, and now it's a positive experience. And so, 
it's figuring out, you know, things like that muzzling, crating, veterinary exams is, is manipulating the environment so that I know, A, I'm making it really easy for him to make the decision that I want, and B, is that if things do go horribly wrong, you know, we've got some mitigation protocols between fencing and, and crates and, and kennel runs and, and long lines and things like that, that we can, you know, get our way out of it relatively easily and, and take as, as little damage as possible or no, uh, ideally. But that's where a lot of it comes from too, is just that, yeah. that hands on, you know, because if, if you can do that with a dog like that, now you're, you're dealing with, you know, the neighbor's labradoodle that, you know, just doesn't, doesn't like its feet being touched or, or whatever now is, is kind of a walk in the park by comparison. So the neat thing is, is that, you know, dog training is dog training when it comes to, you know, no matter what A and B are, how you get from one to the other is largely the same from a principal standpoint. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got another commitment, so I want to get you out of here on time, but yeah, I, I've just, I've been impressed with the training because I've never been able to train a dog the way that I have with, with my two that I have now and largely in part to you. But not only that, it's, it's just made me a, a more thoughtful person, which is yeah. a lot of people will hear that and they'll be like, Oh yeah, you're talking about training a dog. Like how does that apply? And crazy enough, like it's just made me a more thoughtful, even maybe empathetic person to think, okay, well, how can I get this dog to voluntarily want to do that? Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's just and, maybe and a more well-rounded person. For sure. I mean, th there's a lot of similarities between, um, you know, dog training and, and just relationships. I mean, it's a relationship mm -hmm. just like everything else, you know? And right. so, um, you know, it's interesting when I was on Jocko's podcast, you know, he, he went over the book team dog, which is what the, you know, team dog dot pet lessons are, are formulated off of, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was a number of excerpts when he read it. He's like, dude, that's extreme ownership to a T. Like it's the same, same exact concept. Right. It was like, yeah. Uh, you it's know, leadership. So it's all leadership. It is, you know, you know, and, and again, the nice thing with, the nice thing that you gain from doing it with dogs is that, you know, you, you have the ability to, to now apply it to, to all of your personal relationships without kind of thinking about it. You know, you, you can just default to those reinforcement strategies and, and not overthink it because I, I think, you know, one of the problems we have as human beings, especially with training dogs, but even with each other is we overthink, you know, or we don't project and put ourselves in the other person's shoes. And, and you have to do that with a dog. If you don't, you will fail. You know, right. if you, if you can't step into that dog's mind and, and understand how the world works, you know, in, in his mind and how he views it, you're, you're never going to be successful, you know, and it's, it's largely that way with, with all of our human relationships. So, um, you know, just, it, it helps you grow in those areas in a way that, uh, that I think most people would, would consider an unintended positive consequence, but it, it's for sure applicable. Yeah. Well, we'll have to do another conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to get you up to Maine. I know we're going to do that before this whole, whole coronavirus yeah. COVID-19 fallout, but we'll get you up here. Cause I know you're doing some work For with sure. origin and I want to talk about mic drop too, because you're having some conversations that aren't always, aren't always popular or well-received, but critical conversations to be had. So I want to address that too. We'll have to do that in a, another part. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Right on, man. Well, hey, uh, as we wind down, let me ask you a couple of additional questions. The first one, and I've asked you this before when you were on the first time, but uh, what does it mean to be a man? You know, to me, it's just doing what is necessary, you know, and, and you know, to me, there there is, I think, uh, maybe a misconception as to, you know, being a man means, and it's this aesthetic you know, image of, of what being, you know, a double A personality caveman is to me, it, it's, you know, what you do, whatever it is that you want to do, but, but you handle it responsibly, you know, mm -hmm. is that you take accountability for whatever it is that you want to do, you know? And, and, and to me, there's, there's just simply, there's doing the right thing and there's everything else, you know? And, and so it's, it's whatever you engage in being is that you, you make a, a net positive impact on whatever the fuck that is, you know? And to me, that's the essence of a man. It, it's not, you know, having to do super masculine things again, it's, it's whatever it is that you want to do, but, but do it well, be accountable, uh, be net positive and, and don't shortcut shit and do the wrong things and take advantage of people. And, and, you know, to me, that's, that's the essence of it in, in the most simplest nutshell that I can provide. Perfect. It's perfect. All right, man. How do we connect with you? Learn about the training, everything else you got, have, you have going on, including the foundation as well. So the guys know where sure. to go. No, I appreciate it. So teamdog.pet is the online training that I talk about. It's 99 bucks for a full year of unlimited access. Plus I get in 
the forums, the message forums every uh, every Monday morning and answer questions. Um, uh, Tricos.com is where I've got you know my leash and collar, my crates, the CBD oil, um, dog food and treats. Uh, all the different Tricos products that I've developed uh, over the years uh, are available there, as well as the personal protection dog uh, inquiry, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Mic Drop doesn't have its own URL, but if you go on MikeRitland.com or just uh, s- search it on YouTube or iTunes, you can listen to uh, the Mic Drop podcast. And uh, last but certainly not least, the Warrior Dog Foundation uh, is WarriorDogFoundation.org. Uh, again, we've retired almost 200 dogs in the last 10 years. Uh, all of you know, which come from special operations units, police departments, uh, federal law enforcement, you know, customs, border patrol, you you name it. We've pretty much taken a dog from from them as an entity uh, thus far, and uh, and you know, it, it's for sure a labor of love. It's something that uh, you know we all get bit, and uh, and it's it's a, a heartache sometimes. But you know, when you walk through that kennel facility and, and look into the eyes of every single dog, and you know you know, damn well that every single one of them would be, you know, in a, in a box full of ashes on somebody's desk if we hadn't taken them in it is a pretty neat feeling to be able to be a part of that. Uh, and so, you know, we don't have any federal funding. There, there isn't grants or federal funding from the, from the U S military or the, or the department of defense or the U S government, generally speaking uh, for uh, our organization or any of them like it, unfortunately, uh, so all of our support is garnered from private individuals and, and things of that nature. So uh, if you want to check it out, go to warriordogfoundation.org. You can uh, donate there uh, or get involved. You can apply to adopt one of these dogs. I will say, unless you own your own home, don't have any children or other pets uh, and have an understanding how to how to care for these animals, at least at a basic degree. Um, you know, we're, we're not interested in, in adopting dogs out other than right. into those environments be- because it's such a liability, but yeah. Uh, so just keep that in mind if, if you do apply, but, uh, but we're always looking to, uh, to rehome as many of these dogs as we can. Right on Mike. We'll sync it all up. So everybody knows where to go. I really appreciate you. I, I know we've been able to talk and, and build somewhat of a friendship, but, um, you've had a direct impact outside of even that on my family, just because of the way that you've helped me train my dogs and help my kids get involved in that process. And, um, it's just brought us closer together, which is something I really wouldn't have like initially considered, but it's actually been, like you said, one of those unintended benefits of, uh, of working together and working through your programs and courses. Well, I appreciate that very much. And to me, like that's, that's the biggest compliment and, and, uh, you know, purpose driven feedback I can possibly get. So I, I'm humbled to have, I have you feel that way and uh, and honored to be a part of it because it uh, to me that that's just a win all the way across the board. So I appreciate you saying it. Right on, thanks. Especially brother. if you mean it. Yeah, I do. I do. I, you know, I say a lot of things I don't mean, but uh, this is one of those things where I, where I do mean it. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> thanks, man. All right, thank you.